Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. For technical assistance, please phone Redback Support on 1-800-733-416 or to listen to the webinar through your phone instead. The dialing number and passcode is listed in the chat box. Today's topic is subacute stroke data in Victoria NSF and AROC results. We are pleased to welcome our presenter for, presenters for today, Kelvin Hill and Francis Simmons. This webinar is live and interactive. You're encouraged to post questions to our presenters by typing into the chat box in the bottom left-hand corner located to the right of the cog wheel. Your questions will be answered during and at the end of each presentation. I'll now hand you over to Francis. Hi everyone, it's Francis Simmons here. Um, I'm the director of AROC, the Australasian Rehabilitation Outcomes Centre, and um, Sonia from the Victorian Department asked me to be part of this presentation and provide you guys with a little bit of information um, about the data that AROC collects um, on uh, stroke rehabilitation. Um, so I've just got a, a series of a few slides here and I'll, I'll take you through those. If you Like, like the um, introducing person said, if you do have questions, pop them, pop them into the chat box and if it's easy and simple, I'll answer it on the way through. If it's a little bit more technical or it's going to take some time, um, then I might wait till the end of the webinar and we can, Kelvin and I between us can um, answer it then. So I'm going to get going. Um, I've, I'm not. I'm not sure. You're. You're all just little names in a box on the top of my screen here. So I'm not actually sure if if you you guys on the other end of this webinar know what A Rock is. So I just thought I'd very quickly tell you that that A Rock is the Australasian Rehabilitation Outcomes Centre. In effect, we are the Rehabilitation Medicine Clinical Quality Registry for Australia and New Zealand. Um, we established in 2002, therefore we've been running 14 years in Australia and about eight in New Zealand. Um, the membership of AROC is all of the inpatient rehab units in each country, which means in Australia we have about 226, I think, um, inpatient rehabilitation services that provide data to AROC. Um, we have a defined data set of data items that each um, member collects against each and every episode of rehabilitation that they provide and they submit that data to us. That means that we receive data describing more than 120,000 episodes of rehabilitation each year. We take all that lovely data and do lots of analysis with it and feed it back to our members in the form of benchmarking reports or a suite of benchmarking reports um, every six months and, um, and also members can access their own data in between times or contact us if they have specific questions that they'd like us to have a look at the data for. So that's, a, that's a, just a really quick um, overview of what AROC is and what AROC does and, and if anyone's got questions I can go into that a bit more later. But I wanted, I've only got 20 minutes so I just wanted really to focus on stroke. So in the AROC data set stroke comprises about, oh, it's about 5% of the data episodes that we receive. Um, we classify stroke by, in, uh, by an impairment code and he, that on your screen now are the AROC impairment codes. So the, the major split we have is hemorrhagic ischemic and then you can see there are some sub-splits in each of those um, impairment groups. So some of the slides that I'll show you will be looking at stroke data by impairment. So keep those impairments in your head. Whoops, wrong button. Um, we also look at these things called ANSNAP classes. For those of you that aren't from the subacute sector, um, ANSNAP is a, is a classification, just like DRGs are a classification in the acute care sector, ANSNAP is the classification in the subacute sector. Um, and on your screen are the, the, the ANSNAP classes that relate to stroke. Um, so you can see there, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven specific stroke classes. Um, and then two uh, low FIM score um, classes. So within the AROC data set, the functional independence measure, the FIM, is the major outcome tool that we use. 
Um, the ANSNAP classes uh, are, are developed against FIM motor scores, you can see there, and you can see that 4AA1 is a, a person who's had a stroke who's got a reasonably high motor score and a high cognition score, all the way down to 4AA7, where they have a very low FIM motor score. Um, and there's an age split on that one as well. So some of the data that I'll show you today will be by ANSNAP class as well because it's a classification within each of these seven, eight, nine classes. Um, you're looking at resource homogenous groups of patients. So these are patients where it costs about the same amount to provide care for. So you're looking at apples and apples. Okay. One of the reports that we provide as part of our suite of benchmarking reports is what we call a dashboard. Um, this is our attempt to look at things in a, in a very high level sense, um, to provide people with a snapshot of how they have performed um, over the period in question. So this is the first page of our two-page dashboard. Um, and this dashboard happens to be specific to stroke, as you can see on the top there, and it's um, looking at Victorian facilities that have provided stroke data to AROC. Um, the first graphic here on the top left of your screen um, is our way of looking at rehab outcomes by facility, and I'll just orient you to this graph. Um, we look at functional outcome and you can see the vertical axis here is looking at functional outcome and if a particular facility achieves a higher functional outcome than we would have expected given their mix of cases, then they will be on the top half of this vertical axis. If they're achieving a lower functional outcome than we would have expected given their mix of cases, they're going to be on the lower half of this vertical axis. The horizontal axis looks at length of stay and in, this, in a similar fashion, if they're achieving a shorter length of stay than we would have expected given their mix of cases, they'll be on the right hand end of that axis and if they're taking a longer length of stay to achieve uh, the function than we would have expected, they'll be on the left hand side of that um, axis. So what those axes do when we plot a, a, um, the coordinates for each facility, you get a bubble um, and each, the size of the bubble is the volume of data that's been provided by that individual facility. So what you're seeing here is a whole heap of bubbles representing all Australian facilities that provided stroke data to AROC in the financial year 2016. The ones with black circles around them are the Victorian facilities that provided stroke data in 2016. So if you are a facility, this one here is a Victorian one, um, the one with the black circle around it in the green quadrant. The green quadrant basically means that the facility is achieving a higher functional outcome in a shorter length of stay than we would have expected. The opposite quadrant, the red quadrant, means that these people are achieving um, a lower functional gain than we would have expected and taking longer to do it. And then the amber quadrants are in the middle. They're achieving a lot of function, taking longer to do it, or they're not achieving as, as much function as we would have expected, and but they're doing it in a quicker time frame. So that just or, that's quite a nice quick snapshot for people um, looking at where they sit in comparison to everybody else, um, either within their state or, or across the country. Um, the top right, the top right graphic here called performance against benchmark. AROC publishes length of stay and functional change, FIM change, benchmarks by ANSNAP class, so for each of those eight, nine stroke ANSNAP classes. Um, we, we publish a benchmark length of stay and a benchmark FIM change. What this graphic does is tell the facility, in this case all Victorian facilities, that 31% of Victorian episodes, stroke episodes, achieved both a functional gain and length of stay benchmark. 27% achieved the functional gain benchmark but not the length of stay benchmark. 27 achieved the length of stay benchmark but not the functional gain benchmark and 15% achieved neither. Again, a quick snapshot for a facility when they get their individual report on how they're performing against benchmark. The third graphic down here is um, change in accommodation. It's just looking at whether the facility has a, uh, managed in, within their episodes to 
discharge the person from rehab to the same sort of accommodation that they um, were admitted from um, or a different form of accommodation. So if they came from a private residence, going back to a private residence, if they came from a nursing home, going back to a nursing home, or in a different sense, if they came from a private residence and going back to a nursing home, or vice versa. Okay, I, I'm going to keep moving because otherwise I'm going to run out of time. Um, this is the second page of the dashboard, um, and it's got a few indicators on it um, where we would compare. In this case, we're comparing all Victorian facilities against Australian facilities, against things like age, mortality rate, comorbidities, complications, um, episodes with start delays, uh, how long it's taking people to get to rehab after they have their stroke, um, and days between being clinically ready to start rehab and the actual start date, which usually um, is a measure of waiting lists. Um, on the top right, there's some a, a time case mix adjusted uh, length of stay and sim change. So this is how has Victoria been achieving. Uh, in term over time, in terms overall of the length of stay for stroke episodes and the functional change that's being achieved. Um, and you can see both lines are above the zero line. If they had been achieving um, as we would have expected given their mix of cases, then those lines would be on the zero line. You can see here that length of stay appears to have been slowly declining, but it's still above the zero line, which means relative to the rest of Australia, Victorian facilities have a slightly longer length of stay. Um, functional change it came down in, in 2013 and has remained fairly standard since there. Uh, again, it's above the line, so whilst they're staying longer in Victoria, they're achieving more functional gain than we would have expected given their mix of cases. I hope that makes sense to people. Um, the, the graphics down the bottom, I won't spend too much time. They're what we call FIM splats. It's a radar chart. Um, it takes FIM, the 18 items that comprise FIM, and puts them around the outside of the chart. And then each item is scored from 1 to 7, and that goes up the spokes of the chart. And the two lines are, the green line is the, um, the, the, the FIM scores by item on admission to rehab and the dotted purple line is the FIM scores on discharge from rehab. So it's a visualisation of the amount of functional change that is being achieved whilst the person is in rehabilitation. Okay, moving on. So sorry, that was just a blow up of that um, first graphic so you can see a bit more clearly the, the circles in um, Victoria and you can see there's a lot of Victorian circles in the quadrant where they're achieving a higher functional outcome but taking a longer length of stay to do it, which is what I talked about already. Um, so taking just the Victorian units, so we've just cleared away the rest of Australia here, this is just the Victorian units, and you can see in Victoria you have nine facilities in the green quadrant, 13 in the amber quadrants, and three in the red quadrant. Um, looking at volume of stroke, another way of looking at volume and stroke of Victoria. So um, there were 42 facilities across Victoria that reported at least one stroke episode and 29 of those reported between 20 and 181. So you've got quite a lot of volume here. So one facility doing a lot of stroke. The green facilities are public, the blue facilities are private. So you do have a number of private facilities providing rehab for stroke, but they tend to be lower volume than the publics. The publics think, tend to be doing the higher volume stroke. And, um, and the ones here only providing small numbers of stroke, uh, well, they're always a worry for me. Um, if I've got a, a relative that's had a stroke, I want them to go to a unit that does quite a lot of stroke because I'm more comfortable that they know what they're doing. That's just my opinion. Um, over time, you can see here um, the volume public and private over the last five years that's been submitted to AROC. Um, we had a bit of an uh, increase in the number of facilities in Victoria in 2012, so, so um, I think pay scant attention to the 1500 in 2012. But if you're looking at 13, 14, 15, 16, you can see somewhere around that 2000 episodes is what's being um, the, the volume of patients that are having stroke rehab in Victoria. And of that, 1,500 are done in the public sector with about 500 being done in the private sector. 
Um, you always have to have an age and sex graph in here, so here's ours. So if you're looking at um, stroke episodes in Victoria by age and sex, this is the standard graph. You can see that they tend to be very elderly. The bulk of the patients are sitting there between that sort of 75 and 90 age group, um, slightly more males than females. Um, remember that I prov provided the ANSNAP classes for you with 4AA1, which is the, the darkest red um, part of the columns, being the um, least disabled group, and then all the way down to the, the dark green at the bottom being very, very functionally disabled. So you can see that the mix of cases between all those different ANSNAP classes over time hasn't really changed. It's been quite stable. Um, in terms of by impairment, so, so remember um, the 1.1s in the blue were the hemorrhagics and the uh, 1.2s in the green colours are the ischemic strokes. Um, we did have some confusion initially when we put that split in place. I would think you, if you're looking at the 2015-16 data, it's probably most accurately reflecting the, the, um, the the appropriate volumes between the hemorrhagic and ischemic and it looks here that about 30% of episodes and it's remained fairly stable, 30% um, are hemorrhagic and the remainder are ischemic and that's what's been told to us. Um, I did provide you this slide already as part of the, um, the graphic so the dashboard so I won't go over that again in the interest of time. Um, like I said, there are 42 facilities providing stroke and, and we presented to you the differing volume. Here's that volume again, the red ones are providing less than five episodes um, and the yellow ones are um, between 10 and 20 episodes, the green ones are providing more volume. When we provide data to facilities, we will not provide outcome data for anybody providing less than five and we're very sceptical about the data when it's less than 20. Um, completion status, so we're looking at how complete the episodes are. So in AROC terms, a complete episode is one where a patient commences a rehab program, goes through the program, finishes it and is discharged to the community. An incomplete episode is where some sort of medical event usually happens and the person is returned to the acute setter, set, setting. Um, you can see it's quite varied across the units. There are units that have quite high incomplete episodes and we would be wondering what's going on in those units. We would generally expect completion status in stroke to be about 85% of episodes, 85% complete, up to 15% incomplete would be acceptable. Anything outside of that, we ask guys to check their data and outside of that to try and explain what it is that's going on in their particular unit. It could be accurate but we need people to understand what's happening. Um, we showed you that ANSNAP class over the whole of Victoria has remained stable. However, the mix of cases that are taken by different units is quite variable. That's the only message you meant to take from this slide. You can see that the, the mix of cases is very variable across each unit, which is why when we look at outcome data, we adjust for the mix of cases. And I won't go into the detail of how we do that. Um, in this webinar, you just have to trust me that we actually do adjust for the mix of cases. So that when I present a, a graph like this, which is case mix adjusted, length of stay by facility, um, what this is saying is that, and on an adjusted sense, if a individual facility was achieving the length of stay that we would have expected they would achieve, given their mix of cases, their bar would be very close to the on the zero line. Basically, if they're exactly as we would have expected, they'll be on the zero line, just like number 24 is. Um, if they um, have a length of stay that's higher than we would have expected, then they will be on the top side of the graph. And if they have a lower length of stay than we would have expected, they will be on the low side of the graph. And so you can see here, I think the key message on this one is the variability. There is massive variability in terms of case mix adjusted length of stay by facility. And part of what we as AROC do is try to get people to understand what is happening at their individual facilities that's driving this variation. 
Uh, length of stay is only one part of the story. You can have a very good length of stay, but if you're not achieving good functional change, then it's probably not a good outcome for the patient. So we also look at case mix adjusted functional change by facility. Same story, if the functional change being achieved is as we would have expected given the mix of cases, then that would be on the zero line. The bar would be on the zero. So number 13 here, facility 13 is on the zero line. If they're achieving more functional change than we would have expected, they'll be on the top half of the graph. Less functional change than we would have expected, they'll be on the bottom half of the graph. Um, and again, there's quite a lot of variation there. We then put those two concepts together and provide what we call FIM efficiency, CAMI, case mix adjusted relative mean index for FIM efficiency. So here we've um, ordered it in terms of the most efficient to the least efficient. And you can, the graph is that the red bar is what we would have, the efficiency that we would have expected from that facility given their mix of cases. The blue is the actual efficiency given their mix of cases. So you can see in the left hand side of this graphic, number 36, that's facility 36, 33, 27, 34, 16 are more efficient than we would have expected way more efficient. On the other end of the graph, facility 23, 5, 42, 39 are quite a lot less efficient than we would have expected given their mix of cases. So we provide this information to facilities so they can understand where they sit and, and hopefully try and explain it. Um, and then in the benchmarking workshops that we run, um, we try to get facilities talking to each other to, to try and explain why do you look like this when I look like this? What is it that you're doing that I'm not doing that I could be doing? Um, the things that I've only put these in because I think it's a lovely way to show the different levels of function um, by SNAP class. So remember for AA1 was the most um, functional SNAP class and you can see that the um, the, the lighter purple area is what their level of function was before they came to rehab. The darker purple is what was achieved for them when they um, left rehab. So for AA1, for AA2, less functional on the way in. For AA3, screamingly less functional on the way in. Um, four and five, you can see the patterns that are changing. Uh, so it's quite a nice visualization that, that we, we encourage facilities to use so they can understand the different levels of function on the way in and they can use these graphics to, um, to demonstrate not only internally within their multidisciplinary team but also to patients and family what's being achieved for their um, particular patient, for an individual patient. And they're the, the low weights. You can see the very low weight Z classes have really got not much function on the way in but they are achieving um, quite significant gains before they're leaving rehab. Um, we also, AROC also collects a series of dates. We look at, and one of these is looking at how long it takes from the stroke to getting to firstly an acute hospital and then getting into rehabilitation. So the, the sort of limey green colour is the time it takes from the stroke to get to an acute hospital and you can see that's pretty quick in most places. Um, and then the days from acute, how long they're in acute before they get to rehab. Um, the bottom two bars down here you can see that in, in Victoria overall it takes 10 days um, between having a stroke and getting to rehab. Um, but there is quite a lot of variability amongst the units about how long it is taking them to, to, get, uh, to get their patients from the acute into rehab. Um, and again, we, we encourage facilities to discuss with each other how they've achieved a, a quicker turnaround for patients um, or what are the barriers to them having achieved that. Kelvin, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm going to motor. Um, discharge destination, so not only is length of stay and functional change important, but where are these people being discharged to after rehab? Um, this is discharge destination by SNAP class, so the very high functional strokes on the way into rehab um, are basically all going back to a private residence and you can see smaller proportions are going to a private residence depending on the SNAP classes. Overall in Victoria, some 90% of patients coming in for rehab after stroke are going home to a private residence, which is a pretty good outcome. 
it varies by facility. That's all this graph is showing you. Some facilities achieve a better proportion going back to private residents than others, but it will depend a little on their case mix. So we would have to have a look at some of these, like Facility 5, for example. You might want to look at Facility 5 and see if they're taking a lot of the very heavy strokes um, and maybe that's why they have a higher proportion going to residential aged care. But again, it's, it's good for a facility to know why they look like they look. So that's a gallop through some of our stroke data. We, ha we have a lot of data um, and, we do, uh, and we do provide a stroke impairment, spe uh, impairment specific and impairment specific stroke report to facilities that provide us with stroke data which compares their data to the national data um, and they can access that and have a look through it. Um, basically in conclusion from me, case mix information is now routinely collected. Um, which is a good thing and hopefully, at least in part due to AROC, measuring rehab outcomes is also now routine, which is a good thing. Um, the data that AROC ha collects at a facility level should be used in day-to-day -day clinical decision making as well as the benchmarking um, that we undertake as part of our um, provision of feedback to individual members. Data collection is not something that is done as an over and above thing. It's, it's part of routine clinical practice. It's integrated into standard rehab processes. Um, however, we're always learning and we do continue to learn how to use this data better um, and more efficiently to drive improvements in efficiency in the sector and um, enhance patient outcomes. And that's me. Kelvin, do you sh 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 uh, there's one question in the, the box. Um, are there, is there anybody else that's got any burning questions before I hand over to Kelvin? Why don't you go ahead and answer that question? Right? Yeah, okay. Um, so when we set an expected level, expected versus actual, um, because we case mix adjust, it's, it's part of how we case mix adjust. So we understand in at AROC the mix of cases that a facility sees. And we know that given that mix of cases, and we know the data across the whole data set, across the whole of Australia, so we would look at an, a particular ANSNAP class and look at all the data within that ANSNAP class and say that on average in, within that ANSNAP class it, there is a length of stay of 10 days and a functional change of 10 points. Um, however, this individual facility for that SNAP class it has a length of stay of 20 days and is only achieving 10 points. So we would expect them to have a length of stay of 10 days but they've actually got a length of stay of 20 days. And then we do that for each of the ANSNAP classes and, and add it all together. Um, that's, a, that's a very quick explanation of how we do that case mix adjustment. Can I give an example of how this data has been used to change something within a facility? Um, yes, certainly. So it depends on what the facility is seeing. So if someone is seeing that they have um, a longer length of stay and not achieving much functional gain, then we would encourage them to think about why that might be. We would ask them, are they setting expectations? Are they using the, the AROC benchmarks and setting expectations with their patients and carers and team and family on the way in? They know very quickly when a patient hits their ward that they would be fall in, say, 4AA1 to, to pick a SNAP class, and they know what the average length of stay for 4AA1 is, and they know what the functional, the average functional change for that is, for that class is. And we encourage people to use that data to set a level of expectation rather than um, just pulling an expected length of stay out of the air, or in some cases, um, they don't they don't think about it on an expected length of stay and and therefore patients tend to stay to stay longer. It's just putting a bit of discipline around it. Um, in terms of process, if we show some data in a facility clearly takes longer to get a patient uh, from the acute setting into rehab after a stroke, um, we suggest that they potentially talk to those acute um, to their colleagues in the acute setting. 
uh, to we give them some pointers about what the uh, international literature says in terms of the appropriate timeframes for someone to come into rehab. Um, we would maybe put them in touch with another facility that's achieving a really good turnaround time and suggest that they have a chat and see what they can learn from that. So there's, there's, it really depends on what the data is showing as to how people can change things. But they do. There's, it really depends on what the data is showing as to how people can change things. But they do change it, and the data and the data reflects the changes that they make. So that each time they get a report from AROC, they can see how their data is changing. Um, do I need to scroll down? No. Okay. Um, I might leave it there, Kelvin, and, and hand over to you, and we can always take more questions at the other end. Excellent. And yeah, I do encourage you guys to uh, ask us some questions, particularly around AROC data, and try and um, if you can um, get, get Francis a bit tricked. But um, no, please keep that. Tricked? Um, don't ask any of me, just ask him with Francis. <laughs> Um, so I'll let you look at the funny little image while I say hello. Here I am. Um, I think it's really important. It's great that, that Sonia and the network has organised uh, this presentation jointly because clearly there's, over, there's really important overlaps between AROC data and the National Stroke Audit data. And, and you'd know that as indicators, there are um, indicators specifically around patient outcomes and, um, and then there's process level indicators and they marry and go hand in hand often. So AROC is, is an you know, amazing, robust um, uh, outcome um, indicator set um, that, that is, is a registry. So it's collected routinely, prospectively, um, slightly smaller data set. And the audit marries in nicely with that in that it's a retrospective, it's a cohort, so it's a snapshot of 40 consecutive cases. But it's a deeper dive. So it looks at the processes. So what are we doing at a hospital level um, to bring about the outcome? So they can, the data set should be looked at hand in hand. And I must say it's, it's been wonderful working with Francis and the team because we do a lot of the, the planning and the pre-population of, of the relevant FIM data and the other data set um, into the audit so that it's a really nice um, marry between the two. Um, but I'm just going to talk you through the rehab audit this year um, from a very Victorian-centric um, perspective. Um, and so, yeah, please uh, ask any questions as we go along. Um, so this is the, the audit, as you probably well know, there's two components. One is just an organisational survey where we ask a series of questions related to the nuts and bolts of the actual facility, um, infrastructure, staffing, some processes, but mainly just to get a snapshot from our point of view, what services you guys provide out there. Um, and then we importantly ask, do the clinical audit, which as I said, the retrospective case notes of up to 40 consecutive cases. Now you remember from um, Francis', Francis earlier slides, there's not too many, um, there's a whole range of um, services in Victoria that see a number of strokes. Um, not everyone is seeing over 40 annual stroke admissions. So the, the clinical audit is retrospective and it takes a full calendar year. So the last, uh, the audit this year looked at cases that were admitted and discharged in 2015. Um, so that's the, where, where it sort of marries up. Now this is national in Victoria, so you can see the numbers that have participated. Um, 121 centres nationally, 32 in Victoria. And again, you saw from AROC data, there's 42 um, services that are participating in giving AROC data. And, and um, so we have 32 participating in the audit. The audit's voluntary, uh, and so there's slightly less. And we get certainly less public, uh, private facilities participating. And you saw that there was actually quite a, a large contingent of private providers within Victoria. This is just the changes over time for the audit. So you can see, just wanting to point out, that there's been you know, really robust participation over a long period of time. This is now the fifth cycle that we've done, started in 2008. And it's the, the highest number of case notes audited nationally. Um, and just from a Victorian point of view, we can see that the numbers participating has gone up this year and the, and the correlating um, audited cases. The 944, if you uh, remember from AROC, that there was about almost 2,000 cases entered into AROC. 
So you can see that we've got about 50% of those cases are entered into the audit. So it's quite a good robust um, data set to look at processes of care. So I'm just going to just briefly talk about the organisational survey but spend most of the time on the clinical data. We in the National Stroke Foundation, as many of you know, have a national framework where it outlines key essential elements, um, talks about different models of care um, and principles behind rehabilitation. Um, this survey specifically looks at the essential elements that have been recommended and there's 10 of those, sort of basic things from goal setting to um, patient information, discharge care planning. Um, and nationally, the, the average of all centres is six out of the ten. But you can see from state by state, there's some, some variation in that. Victoria's right on the, the average. Um, some of the, and I've just, I've just picked a couple of the elements um, to focus on. So this, this data presents Victorian and national data for the last two audit cycles. And this is element two. So this is a specialised interdisciplinary stroke team with access to stroke education, professional development. Um, you had to answer yes for two different questions related to the survey in order to get a tick that you met this element. So Victoria in 2014 was behind the national average and you can see that there was some good improvement um, over the last two years and that might be related to a range of factors, um, might be the, the national um, conference, for example, was in Victoria last year, and that could be, could be one reason. But, so that's really pleasing to see that there's more, because we know that information and education um, improves you know, knowledge, skill, and specialisation. So we're very keen to, for site to do that. Um, this is element number eight. This is uh, one that's more of a challenge. It's about transfer of care follow-up and re-entry, which we know in rehab is, is challenging. And you actually had to answer three um, different bundles in order to get a yes for this, and that's why it's slightly lower. But you can see from Victoria, higher than the national average on this element and improved significantly. So there's some good processes and systems in place across Victoria, although there's still room for improvement. And the last one I wanted to share is just about the support for the person and, and to maximise participation. Victoria's dropped back, surprisingly. So not, not everything has improved. Some things have actually dropped back from 2014. Um, but it's right on the national average, but I think there's more could be done in that space. So moving on to the clinical audit results. Um, so this specifically maps to the clinical guidelines, which as many of you know are being updated and consultation has just con concluded and we're trawling through um, the feedback which should be provided. Thank you very much. So again, uh, this is, we've looked at about seven major um, processes of care indicators that we've highlighted in the audit this year and looked at changes over time. So this is the first one, goal setting with the team and the patient. Obviously with rehabilitation, goal setting is fundamental, but it's done very well. It's sort of uh, bread and butter for rehab services. And you can see that since 2010, Actually, nationally, it's gone up from 80% to 90%. And in Victoria, which is the orange, that's one above, it's done very well. Um, so that's really pleasing to see. The second indicator is on mood. So we know that there's a high prevalence of mood disorder after stroke. It's at least one in, one in three. And that's acute rehab and long-term in the various settings. We've got good uh, observational data for that. So we're really keen to know, are people um, being assessed for mood? Do, do we even know in rehabilitation, uh, do they have a mood disturbance? Clearly they've gone through what could be a life-changing event and there's normal grief, but we really want to get um, an awareness of mood so that there's better treatment. So there's a series of three questions. Um, again, this is just from this year's audit and it's looking at it, the Australian average compared to the Victorian average. So in Victoria, there's more patients um, assessed or screened for mood, um, but we still think obviously at 56% there's a significant gap in care and we'd like to see that higher. So of those that were assessed, 50% um, in Victoria were identified as having an impairment. That's a massive um, number and if, if we're only assessing, you know, just over 50%, there's a lot of people getting un, undiagnosed. Um, and then the separate question that we ask is, was there psychology follow-up? We know that you know, obviously psychology is a, a really critical but often stretched service. 
um, and you can see that, that just over a third of patients, if they had the impairment um, present, will actually support psychology services. So we think there's a real need to improve access to psychology across the country, but also in Victoria. This just shows the, the average um, for each state, and you can see Victoria here is middle of the ground. Um, but importantly in the audit we do, our benchmarking is, is based on the high performing sites. So we actually get the average of those sites that are done the best. But instead of just getting um, isolated results from sites that might have very small numbers, the averages on the, the um, sites that see at least 15% of the whole cohort. So in this case, 3,500 that participated in the audit, the, the benchmark was, the achievable benchmark was the top, um, the average of the top um, sites that admitted and audited at least 15% of the cases, so 500 cases or so. So you can see everyone's well below what we think is achievable. Smooth. And this is just a split across the state. So this is Victoria looking at the average and you can see very similar to Francis's um, presentation that there's variability across the state. Some very high achievers on, on, on the top, right through to some, some of the stragglers down the bottom. So, yeah, but very wide range of, of um, achievement in mood screening. The next indicator we looked at is patient education. So this is uh, anything from when to stroke, hospital management, second prevention. Um, and this actually dropped this year compared to previous audits and we're not exactly sure why but you can see Victoria compared to some other states is um, lagging uh, I would have to say so we're not sure why and the achievable benchmark is up around 90% so sites are actually doing very well and again there's great variation across the state so you, you can just see um, a few high performing sites and we're really wanting to capture what they've done to do this well and to share that with the others to try and improve that across the state. Um, part of the information and one thing we've been sort of harping on about is, is information about intimate relationships and we ask two questions in the audit. One is were they given routine information and then were they given an opportunity to actually talk to someone. Um, we know that there's been work in Victoria and there's been a real focus and so it's really disappointing. This is um, uh, national data I believe, but it's similar in Victoria that, that really there's been no in improvements at all in this over time and if anything it's dropped back a little bit since the last audit. So, we, so this, is, this is as simple as putting a, a pamphlet down and running back out the door um, and you can tick the box and it's just not being done. So we, we're really wanting to, to make sure there's a holistic view on information provided to the patient and the family. Clinical indicator four for us was, was around um, secondary prevention and this was specifically around education and lifestyle advice. So if, uh, we need to identify those and, and people with the risk factors and, and provide them with advice to change their behaviour. We know drugs are one very important component and I'll get to that next but this is um, just about that lifestyle, um, diet, ed exercise, etc, smoking. So we can see Victoria here is again lagging, it's really disappointing to see because we, you know, my view on Victoria's rehab services is actually very strong um, and robust and yet some of the processes are still very poor uh, across the state, the lowest performing state. And changes over time on this indicator certainly has been low historically and it is, it appears to be improving um, but Victoria is still lagging behind the national average and we still think that there's huge um, improvements needing to be made there. Some of that is in the documentation, um, but we still think that there's significant um, improvements that need to occur for this indicator. The fifth indicator is, is uh, specifically blood pressure medication. Again, we do this relatively okay, um, but it's, it's not really improved significantly. It's sitting at about that 80%, it's actually dropped away a little bit. Sites are doing better and I think the, the achievable benchmark is, is achievable, around one in ten might have reasons, realistic reasons why they wouldn't be. If they're very old, they're going back to a nursing home, etc. you're not going to get the full benefits of anti-hypertensives. Um, but we still think there's people being under-treated 
and we know that if you start medication, you're far more likely to be adhering to that medication long term. So the critical message is to start it while they're in an in inpatient setting before they get back to the community. And this is how the performance across the state. Um, again, a lot of variation, and a lot of, you know, a large percentage of sites are getting 85% or more, but there's there's uh, you know, worrying this, this large percentage that are getting under 75%. So a quarter of patients are missing out on what we would say is routine standard um, practice of getting blood pressure medication. What about carers? So this is a range of, of practice indicators, looking at Victorian and Australian data. Training is you know, relatively good in rehab. Um, whether they have, did they have a comprehensive needs assessment, whether that's partly documentation, but Victoria's uh, underperforming um, and peer support resources within Victoria is also lower than national. Not everyone's going to want to attend a you know, peer support group or whatever, but we should, should be providing that opportunity. The sixth indicator is, is about discharge care planning. This is about the care plan developed with the team. We can see there's actually some really high performing states. Tassie is being smaller, South Australia being a little bit smaller, but they've still got robust numbers in there and they've done very, very well. Victoria, unfortunately, is last again. Um, it's just good to be able to compare to other states um, and see where the achievable benchmark is here. Changes over time for Victoria, you know, had been going up and thought it was, was quite good at 90% was excellent last audit cycle and then it's dropped off quite considerably both with Victoria and nationally. And so there's real focus I think for, for discharge care planning and a lot of work being done by Alana who I can see online and others with our team around uh, my stroke journey and care planning. So ask us for support, look at those who are doing this well and that's just another thing but it's so important to prepare patients for their life. Um, when they get back to the community, it's an important process. So all of the data that this that I've presented is is on Inform Me, which is our national platform for the Stroke Foundation. You can log in and get approved once you're approved. See your own data benchmarked against not just the state comparisons, but benchmarked against um, different similar sized hospitals. So we do a split in three ways about whether they're small numbers of admissions, for those that see I think under 30 annually, whether it's medium number of admissions or large centres and you can compare yourself depending where you sit, that's the peer comparisons within informing and your, and your, your data um, summary. Um, there is a summary that we've sent out to CEOs or service directors as well just to give them a top line um, view like a dashboard that, that Francis sends out for AROC. But I just want to finish off because data is only as good as the how it's being used. So we can, you know, you can be collecting all the data on the world, and you guys do an amazing amount of data collection, both for AROC but also for the audit. You know, we're just amazed each cycle how much commitment there is to, you know, trying to improve and and understand how you're doing it. But we know that there's this constant gap in practice and this lost in translation. This sort of um, this notion that yeah we're aware of it, but we do we actually change our behaviour? What can we do to to better adhere with what we know the processes are in order to get the better outcomes for our patients? What are some of those simple steps? We know there's obviously, and I, I got this from Sonia many years ago, and unfortunately she she's not online. But there's many reasons why we don't change. We know that, um, but there there are some simple things that we know in the evidence does lead, lead to a change in practice. And these are some of the, the generic sort of steps that I'd encourage you guys to do um, you know, after this presentation, but I'm hoping you know, that you take away is to review the data, try and understand the data. What does it mean? How do we apply it? What, what's it telling us? And some of that might be to go back and explore the data. But of those things, what, you can't you, um, change everything. What are the main things you want to change? Both particularly at a team level, and get together in a team and say, look, how, why aren't we performing well? Try and answer some of the questions and to understand why. The, the literature in, in this says you've got to understand your local barriers and enablers. What are the things that stop you from doing this well? What, what are the processes that, that are happening 
that, that you need to be identifying? And then how do you pick the right solutions to overcome that and to improve? Um, importantly, you've got to write it down. It's like goal setting. You can say, yeah, I'll do that. But you're actually more likely to do something if you write it down. And it's the same with quality improvement. Having, having a, a quality improvement plan set time frames and you can there's actually a section in inform me where you can step through and we give you a template of how you can do this um, so we encourage you to utilize that um, use the data look at your local issues pick the right strategies test it implement it you know tweak it and then embed that change and, and move on to the next thing um, that's sort of the generic steps so where to from here Obviously, utilise the data. We've got the Stroke Foundation has two websites. One, Enable Me, which is a consumer website. We strongly support you guys. Um, let patients know um, what's out there, and Inform Me is the health professional website where all the data, guidelines, the quality improvement plans are. Um, and I'm just going to stop there. And we've got a good eight to ten minutes for, for questions for Francis. Remember, <laughs> um, really awesome to see. And I think I think just Consider AROC and the audit being hand in hand. It gives you, you know, two different parts of the puzzle, and if you put them together, they're really useful to drive quality improvement and quality care. I just want to thank you for your time. Any questions, Francis? Where the, your website? Where where can people log on and find more information? Uh, if you just go AROC gov.au, I think. We just got a new one. Uh, uh, well, it's not a new one, but it points to the same place. If you just Google AROC, we come up. <laughs> I don't know why, but we do. So that's good. I mean, and these present I think the, the website was on the last slide of my presentation, and this presentation, this whole thing's been recorded, so um, it's going to be available to people so they can look on to the presentation, look at the presentation too, and find those details. Do you want to say anything about just uh, the workshops that you run, or how you can you would recommend the use of the data to, to bring about change? Uh, I'm just echoing exactly what you're saying. Really, um, we we do run benchmarking workshops, and I think Sonia must have attended one of those or had some input from somewhere um, um, about the about the workshop that we run. So we, we do gather people together from across a particular jurisdiction. So in Victoria's case, we invite all our Victorian members to come to a benchmarking workshop and we present the Victorian data and we, we, strong, and we, and we present it in, a, in an identified form with permission from the attendees. And, and we do strongly encourage discussion across, um, across services so that they can learn from the high achievers. Um, and see if there are any sort of things that they can go forth and implement. Um, we've, it's been it's been very encouraging in the jurisdictions where we've run workshops over a number of years now. We're really seeing a maturity. Um, firstly, I guess in in the level of understanding of the actual data, um, so they they actually look at the data and understand what it means and are translating that into things that they need to do. Um, and then in the in the more mature jurisdictions, we then encourage the people attending those workshops to actually stand up and present a quality initiative that they have implemented based on what they learnt about their service from the AROC data. And we, we're getting some really lovely presentations, some very exciting, very innovative things that people are doing. And of course, because they're presenting them in that sort of forum, then it's things that other people can then pick up on and implement as well. So um, it's it's like a it's like a rolling stone gathering moss, really. It's it's speeding up in those jurisdictions that are really focused on it. We're starting to see some significant improvements. Yeah, great. And we, it's the same. We've, we've run a similar program throughout Queensland and um, certainly just having that facilitated workshop, bringing people together, reviewing the data has been very, very um, useful. There's a question from Melissa about where will these recorded, where will the webinar be available? Um, it we will be linked, I um, believe, to the VSCN website, but we also link, um, I'm pretty sure we link them in Inform Me um, and any of the previous presentations within the Victorian um, Clinical Network are listed there as well. So um, 
check on that. Yeah, um, Sarah's asking where do we find out more information about the AROC workshops. Um, we we tend to invite uh, our the, the key contacts that we have from each facility. Um, so, uh, which facility are you from, Sarah? Bendigo. Okay, great. Um, so I can I can certainly look up and see uh, who is our key contacts in Bendigo and and potentially give you um, an, an indication of who you should contact. Uh, are you do you do you you work in rehab? So would we have you in our system? Are you a FIM trained person? Because if you are, I can just look up your, I've got your name here. Yes, okay, so you're Sarah Andrews. Okay, great, Sarah. Um, I'll look you up in our system and I'll send you our key contact for Bendigo. How's that? Sarah Andrews, Bendigo. And no problem. Wanting to Eddie's question, um, where can we see what the top scoring units are and strategies for improving? Um, look, it's one of the things that we, we try and do and AROC does at the workshop is, is identifying those high performers. We try and capture and we talk to those that have done the best and get them to share in, in a case study and we try and quote, we've got a few posted on Informe. Um, we're just tweaking that um, process um, and we'll be contacting sites. And moving, a, moving forward, we're starting to, to work out if we can do this a bit smarter and even post um, nationally the sort of 10 highest performing sites across the state, um, across the nation, sorry, um, and post that on, on the website. So sort of just formal recognition of sites that have done well. But there are some, and post that on, on the website, so sort of just formal recognition of sites that have done well. But there are some case studies and we, we will we'll be capturing others. If you want to get in touch with um, me, and I didn't give you my, my email address, and Francis, you should probably give yours as well. Um, but if you email me at khill at Stroke Foundation, that's K H I W L -L at strokefoundation.org.au, then um, we can put you in touch with um, potentially some of the areas that you're looking at and see whether, whether we can link you to, to sites that have done particularly well in, across Victoria. Um, we're probably not as um, ahead as that. Um, it's something we've thought of in terms of getting getting people to write up case studies. We can get them to present what they've done and they're quite happy to do that. Getting them to actually sort of write it up as a case study is a bit trickier. Um, we, we haven't had a lot of success getting people doing that but we'll keep pursuing it. Where we come up with interesting resources, we actually um, put those on our website. So if someone's come up with a particular form or a, a, or a, a good a thing that they use with their expected discharge date above the patient's bed, then we will provide um, that in our on our AROC website under the tools and resources page. Um, um, and we also are looking at at least initially at um, telling facilities when they have been a high performer on on any particular indicator. We, we haven't got to the stage of publishing it. Um, uh, and we'd have to get permission from everybody to do that, but but at least we're trying to provide the recognition to those individual hospitals. Um, and Madison, yes, Madison Rush. If if Madison, if you're in my database as a FIM trained person, I'll find you and send you the Warrnambool contact. Any other questions from anybody? Anybody that wants to contact AROC or me, just just contact AROC at uow.edu.au. Again, that email address is on the last slide of my presentation. Um, that's a generic AROC inbox, and um, um, if you if you address it to me, somebody will send it to me. Uh, otherwise, the appropriate person will answer your questions, depending what they are. And I just want to thank you um, from, from our end, I think just as program, you know, Francis and myself, just for the commitment that you guys do to, to improving, you know, the lives of people suffering from stroke. Um, it's, it's really inspiring to see how much you guys are doing. So just keep, keep up the good work and let us know if there's ways that we can be improving the support that we provide to what you guys do. Yeah, I'll ditto that. <laughs> All right.
Okay, just no further questions. I guess we can hand back to Kelvin, hand back to the red back person. It's three o'clock, so those of you that have had the hour. Yep. Back to you, Ronald. Okay. Oh, Bridget. Okay, sorry, let me write that one down before you take that away. Bridget, Bridget. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Francis and Kelvin, for a very informative session, and thank you, everyone, for participating participating in our webinar. We ask you to please stay logged in to take our in-room survey and we make sure that you complete the, survey by com the full survey by scrolling down and clicking on the orange submit button at the very bottom. We thank you in advance for your feedback, wish you a pleasant afternoon and hope to see you at another webinar soon.